Amen. You may be seated. I just love that song. I love the instrumental toward the end, that brass section that just stands out. I don't know what it is, trumpet, trombones, or whatever it is, but it's uh, best listened to with an earbud in your ear so you can turn it up. Uh, Galatians chapter 3. That's where we'll be at. Put your finger there, and uh, we'll be there in just a moment. But in 1899, a little girl named Lyndon was born. Uh, she loved her daddy very much, and her daddy loved her as well. He was a man with a prominent position, especially in that day and time. He was a bank manager, and during that time, that was a very respected position, uh, thought highly of in, uh, in the community. But the tragic thing was, Lyndon's dad was an alcoholic. <clears throat> he lost his job. He lost his self-respect. He nearly lost his wife and his three girls as well. But Lyndon, as a child, what she would do, as a lot of children would do, she started making up stories. She started uh, fantasizing about these stories in her head. And maybe these stories that she made up and she dreamt up and that she shared with her uh, other, other siblings and the family, maybe those stories helped her deal with some of the confusion and uh, the, the depression and the pain in her life. So she makes up these stories about how a lady would come into their house and change everything around. This lady revived everything. She repaired everything. You would have thought that things at some point would have gotten better in Lyndon's life and the life of the, of the family, but things just got worse. The father at 43 dies of tuberculosis. Things went continued to spiral down to go from uh, to, get, to progress and even to a worse situation but she continued to make up stories about this lady this lady who would blow in from the east on an east wind and she would come into the home and she would make everything happy again Lyndon was eight at that time when she began telling these stories. You don't know her probably not as Lyndon, but you know her possibly better as Pamela Travers. P.L. Travers. Pamela Lyndon Travers. And that lady that would blow in and change everything was Mary Poppins. P.L. Travers kept that story and that hope alive for her whole life. She was always hoping for somebody to come in and change the past. P.L. Travers was always hoping for somebody to reverse the irreversible. She was always hoping for somebody to come in and save the unsavable. She was always longing for somebody to come in and redeem the irredeemable. P.L. Travers spent time with uh, the Native Americans, with the Indians here in the United States. She was looking, she was looking to them, looking for them to change her past. Maybe she could find something to change the unchangeable in her life. When she didn't find it with the Native Americans, she went to Japan and she studied and sat down with the Zen masters in Japan and she was again looking for somebody or something to reverse the irreversible in her life. She wanted something to remove the pain. She wanted something to remove the hurt and the grief that she had lived with her whole life. She was looking for somebody to blow in to her life and change it. But she never found it. P.L. Travers' grandchildren said of her, when she died, she died loving no one and having never been loved by anybody. She looked for love. Pamela Travers looked for love everywhere but the cross. Maybe you come this morning. Maybe you're sitting here. Maybe you're longing, looking for something to change in your life. You're looking to change the past. You want to know that your future is secure. You're wanting to repair some kind of hurt in your life. And you wonder, does the cross reveal anything? Is there any hope in this empty 
tomb? Is anything revealed on a day like today? Or will I leave here with the same old hopelessness, unchangedness? Will I leave here in the same dire situation that I came in? There is hope, friends. There is a change. Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> the cross does change things. The cross makes a difference. The empty tomb for sure makes a difference. The empty tomb did something for you that you could not do for yourself. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. <clears throat> Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Maybe this Easter you're asking, what can change in my life? How can I experience this change? Can the unchangeable be changed? Can the unsavable be saved? Can the irredeemable be redeemed? And the answer is yes. Christ, He came to the cross to do something for you that you cannot do on your own. He did it for you eternally. Now the first thing we're going to see that Christ redeemed us from a curse because He becomes the curse for us. Keep your finger in Galatians chapter 3 but turn to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 21. Christ is going to be the curse for us. But here in Deuteronomy chapter 21, we're going to see that sin blinds you to what sin really is. Sin covers your eyes. Sin uh, distracts you from what it is. Sin blinds you to the cost that it will charge for your life. Sin blinds you to the payment that it requires. Sin always talks about giving more, but it never fulfills its promise. Sin leads us to believe that if I just indulge in this, then all will be well. I'll feel good about myself, but it always leaves, it always leaves you empty. Here in Deuteronomy, Moses is going to talk about a man I'm going to talk about a situation of a curse. I'm going to talk about a man who is cursed and who is hanging on a tree. And this was written 1,600 years or so before Christ. And this new generation is about to enter the promised land. So chapter 21 of Deuteronomy, verse 22 and 23. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree. His corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day. For he who is hanged is accursed of God, so that you do not f defile your land, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. Now God didn't say hang somebody on a tree for death. That's not what is being said here. He's saying, but after he is dead, hang him on a tree. Then you hang him on a tree. After he is dead, you hang him on a tree. And there's a reason that God says it this way. Here in Deuteronomy, it's not you hang him on a tree to die, but you hang him on a tree as an example, as, as a symbol, as a symbol of a curse. So Moses is talking about a sin that is being so terrible, a sin that is so heinous in, in, in situation, in stature, that when judgment falls on a person, that you can put him on a tree. And not for a few, not for a day, not for a few days, but just for a few short hours. Moses says when a person has committed a sin that is so bad that after they're dead, you can put them on a tree. You can hang them as an example of the curse of sin on human life. Now when we think of cross, 
our first image. When we hear of somebody hanging on a tree, our first image, our first mindset is to go to the New Testament. And we think of three crosses in the New Testament. But I'm going to show you three crosses in the Old Testament this morning. So Joshua. Look at Joshua chapter 10. Just a little bit to the right. Joshua chapter 10. And as you're finding that, I'm going to give you the background to this. The people are entering the land. Uh, they're, they're taking this, the, the, the land, but their enemies are rising up to kill them. Uh, the Israelites, the Hebrews, they're coming into the land, but as they come into the land, there's groups of people that don't want to relinquish that, that don't want to turn it over, that don't want to give it to them. And there's going to be five kings and five armies that are going to rise up against the Hebrews, and they're going to uh, stand against them. But this, these five kings and these five armies, this is also the passage where the sun stands, stands still. You remember that. The sun stands still for, for like a day there. And it's, it stands in that way. It stands uh, there in the sky so that the Hebrews, so that the Israelites can go out there and slaughter these armies. So that uh, Joshua has prayed, Lord, give us this light. Allow the sun to, to stay up so that we can go out there and take this land and so we can defeat these armies. So they do. They go out there and they begin to wipe these armies out. The armies, uh, the kings flee, the survivors, the ones who are left out of these, uh, out of these armies, out of these, uh, with these kings, they flee to fortified cities, but these kings are going to flee to a cave. And Joshua's going to go in there and he's going to hunt them out of this cave and he's going to capture them. So Joshua chapter 10 verse 26. So afterward Joshua struck them and put them to death. And he hanged them on five trees and they hung on the trees until evening. Now why are they on trees? Because they stood against God. These five kings, they rebel. The God has, has given this land to the Hebrews. They're going to walk in. They're going to take possession. God is going to run these other armies out. But what happens to these kings? These kings rebel against God. They, they stand against Him. They, don't, uh, they fight against God. And, and Joshua goes in and he hangs them on a tree. Hangs them on a tree until evening, it says. And the second tree is in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 18. A little further to your right. So the five kings, they're enemies of God. That's their sin. They're an enemy of God. So you keep that in the back of your mind. An enemy of God equals hanging on a tree. 2 Samuel 18. Here is the son of of a king. The son of a king is uh, unintentionally he's going to hang himself on a tree. But he is going to uh, see the king's army, David's army. This is Absalom here. Absalom is going to see the king's men and he's going to kind of flee maybe as fast as he can. But as he's fleeing he's going to get hung up in some low hanging oak trees. And he's going to be left there. And so he's unintentionally going to find himself. This is Absalom who, who takes over the kingdom from his father. He, he runs his father out, but his father David comes back to take over the kingdom from his son Absalom. But here's what happens in 2 Samuel 18 verse 9. Now Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. For Absalom was riding on his mule. And the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak, so that he was left hanging between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under him kept going. So this doesn't, this doesn't kill him. Absalom's riding that mule. He sees the men of David. He flees them. He's running from, from uh, the king's men. He gets stuck in a, a, what appears to be a fork of a branch. His head is stuck there, and he's just suspended there. So verse 14, this is what happens. Uh, one of David's servants has seen this and reports back to Joab and, and says, I saw Absalom there. He's hanging there between heaven and earth. 
uh, his mule has left him. And, and uh, Joab says, well, why did you kill him? You should have killed him. I would have paid you. I would have given you ten pieces of silver and a belt if you would have killed him. And the servant says, for a thousand pieces, I would not have killed the king's son. But Joab says, let's do something. Something must be done about the one who has sinned against the king. So here's what Joab does in verse 14. Verse 14, so Joab, he took three spears in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while yet he was still alive in the midst of the oak tree. So Absalom is hanging there. He's still alive. Joab rides up to the scene and he sticks a spear through the side of Absalom. Does that sound like anybody hanging on a tree with a spear stuck through their side? That's the second cross in the Old Testament. So the first one who needs death was an enemy of God. That was worthy of hanging on a tree. The second person who is worthy of hanging on a tree is the one who has sinned against the king. So Joshua, uh, here now we're into 2 Samuel chapter 21. A little further to the right, we're going to see the third cross. Joshua has made a covenant with the Gibeonites, and they have made a pact with them. 2 Samuel chapter 21, uh, the Gibeonites have they've made an agreement, a covenant. Joshua has made a covenant with them. You guys can stay here in the land. We will not destroy you. We're not going to wipe you out. Uh, you, you and the Hebrews, we can all live at peace together. There will be peace among us. But Saul is going to become king. And Saul is, is uh, zealous. He, is, um, he, he wants full control. I told you Saul was all about Saul. He is only interested in himself. Saul is only interested in self-preservation as well. So as Joshua is gone from the scene, Saul arises, he becomes king. He's going to break this covenant with the Gibeonites. And he is going to slaughter them, almost run them into extinction. So this covenant is broken. A covenant that has been established between the, the, the Hebrews, the children of Israel, and the Gibeonites. So Saul dies and, so, and uh, David becomes king. And David wonders, in, in verse 1 there, you can read it, you can pick up on the reading. David wonders why year after year after year, for three years now, we have gone through a drought. There's a drought in the land. God, and he petitions God. God, why is there this drought in the land? God reminds him of that covenant that was broken. So David David contacts the Gibeonites and says, how can I make this right? How can I, uh, how can I set this injustice correct? How can we uh, correct this? David says, that you name the price and I will give you any amount of gold and silver that you require. The Gibeonites respond, we don't want your gold and silver, but what we want are some of the children of Saul. And David says, I'll send seven of them over. That's what their request was. They said, give us seven of Saul's descendants because he tried to annihilate us. He tried to exterminate us. That's what they're saying in verse 5. But verse 9, he says, David, he gives them into the hands of the Gibeonites. And they hang them in the mountain before the Lord. So that the seven of them fell together. And they were put to death in the first days of harvest at the beginning of the barley harvest. So these descendants of Saul are going to have to bear Saul's sin. And they're going to hang on a tree because... Saul broke a covenant, really because they all did, the whole family there, the whole family broke a covenant between the Gibeonites and the Hebrews. A covenant was broken. So who hung on a tree in the Old Testament? You have three trees in the Old Testament, and you have three different scenarios, each of them saying, that is worthy to be hung on a tree and displayed 
for the sin that they committed. The first one that hung on a tree was an enemy of God. The second one that hung on a tree was a traitor to the king. And the third one that hung on a tree was a person who broke the covenant of God. Now, I don't know if you're listening or not, or if you're just sitting there, but you're guilty of all three. All three of them, you yourself, have committed. And the Old Testament shows that that's worthy to be hung on a tree. A few weeks ago, you learned, we talked about being an enemy of God. So you're familiar with that. You're a traitor of God as well because you have turned your back on God. At times in your life, you know you've done it. You have turned your back on God and you have fully embraced the world and what it has to offer. You know you have. And you have broken the covenant of God as well. So if those people... If those people, they did that and they got a cross, what do you deserve? What do you deserve? Because you have committed those three as well. The cross shows that you're under a curse. Now back to Galatians. You are under a curse. The curse of sin, death, curse of a cross curse of the wrath of God. The curse of separation for eternity from God. In your natural state, you are in a sinful state. But here's the cure. You say, well, all that is terrible. This is Easter Sunday. This should be something nice. This should be uplifting. I should leave here encouraged. I should leave here excited. I should leave here with some hope. I should leave here with a pep in my step or, or, you know, floating on a cloud because Christ has done something for me. You better believe He's done something for you. Galatians 3, verse 10 says this, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it's written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. That's what the Scripture says. The Scripture says, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by the law. And what is the law useful for? The law is useful. It's a schoolmaster. It's to show you that you cannot keep the law. That was the purpose of the law. That you on your own cannot keep the law. Nobody apart from Christ has ever been able to keep the law. So what are you? Verse 10 says cursed. You're cursed. You're cursed. And under that curse, you're worthy to be displayed on a tree. But, but verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the law. Cursed is everyone who does not follow the law. Cursed is everyone who does not live up to a holy God. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Now here's what that means. And this is good. Verse 10 here says we're under the curse. But this word become here in in. In verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse that we're under. Verse 10 says that. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become. That word become in verse 13 means Christ, Christ is over us. We're under a curse. Here's curse. Curse sets here because you have broken the law. Because you have not lived up to God's standard. Because you have not lived up to the holiness of God. You're under that curse. That curse sits on top of you. The whole weight of that curse is on your shoulders. You can't stand under that curse. There is no way you can enter the presence of a holy God under that curse. 
Because you've sinned. You've broken the covenant of God. You've rebelled against the king. So you're cursed. You're under that curse. Verse 13 says, Christ redeemed us from what you're under. That redeemed right there in verse 13, that means you have been purchased out of. Christ comes. You're under a curse, but Christ comes in and He comes between you and that curse. It's no longer curse and you. It's curse, Christ, and then you. Christ separates you from the curse. Christ takes the full weight of that curse. Christ takes the full magnitude of that. And it says Christ redeems us from that curse. He became a curse. You were under a curse. Christ became the curse. He comes in between you and the curse. And then it says He redeems you. Now that redeem means that He goes down. That means that, that somebody goes into the marketplace. Redeems. Somebody goes into the marketplace and purchases something. Christ redeemed you. He went into the marketplace of the world. Christ comes from heaven, comes from his home in heaven, and he goes into the marketplace of the world, and he walks up to the vendor there, and he says, what is the price for humanity right here? Because humanity on its own is under a curse, and I'm going to come between humanity and the curse. I'm going to take that. I'm going to redeem them. And he comes up to Satan there at his marketplace, and he says, you name the price, and I will redeem them. And Satan says, says it'll take your blood and Christ says I'll give my blood you take the chains off of them and you put them on me that's what the redeem means Christ went into the marketplace of the world and he purchased you from the curse and it was his blood that paid the price you could not bear it on your own but Christ became the curse for you and removed that from you. Why? Who went to the tree? Who should have went to the tree? Who broke the law? You did. You broke the law. But who went to the tree? You're not going to a tree, are you? You're a believer. You will not go to a tree because Christ went to the tree for you. Abraham Lincoln was shot at a little after 10 p.m. on April the 14th, 1865. He lived until the early, very early morning, I believe, of the next morning there, April the 15th. They rushed him. They picked up his body there at Ford's Theater. Having been gunned down, he, they picked up his body. They rushed him to, the, to a, a, a house, a room next door across the street there. They... Uh, placed him on a, on a bed and today you can go into that house you can look at the pillowcase you can look at the blood that is stained on that pillowcase you can look probably at some clothes that are there you can look at a, a bloody towel a bloody sheet you can see the blood of Abraham Lincoln that was spilt out, that was poured, that was left as a stain to remember. He's the great emancipator, the one who freed the slaves. The slaves had chains on them. They were slaves to bondage. They were under bondage. But yet the blood of Lincoln is left to be a reminder of what the tragedy of this nation, of what it went through. Lincoln rescued the slaves from the chains. But his blood can do you no good in eternity. His blood will not save your spirit. His blood will not save your soul. You can go. You can see his stains. You can see where he was shot. You can see where this man died. You can see his blood. But the blood of Lincoln will not save you. The only blood that will save you is the blood of Jesus Christ who took the curse for you. So you can be happy 
this resurrection morning. You can be glad. You can be joyful. You can turn your frown upside down because you don't have to go to a cross. You don't have to pay for your judgment because the Son of God has already paid. I want to ask you to bow your head. I want to sing a, a closing song this morning and maybe you have a decision to make in your life. Maybe you would like to give thanks to, to Jesus for His work on that cross so that you don't have to go. So as we sing this last song, if the Spirit moves in you to make a decision... We're going to be taking communion as well and maybe you want to ask for forgiveness also. Maybe you want to reflect back on some things. So as we sing this song, if you need to come forward, if you need to take that celebration of, of Jesus, the, the thankfulness of Jesus, what He's done for you, I encourage you come out. Step out of your pew. Step out of that aisle this morning. Let me pray with you. Pray that you take Jesus by the hand. You let Him take your curse for you because you cannot carry it. Amen.